Mine are glitched there. Those on Facebook can hear me now. <laughs> For a while they couldn't hear me. Okay, let's uh, dive into this text tonight. We are all shaped by many things. Wouldn't you agree? How we were raised, our family life as children, the school that we were educated at, the community city that we were raised, our own personal experiences, on and on I can go. Many things in life shapes who we are. Paul is pleading with the Colossian church to seek maturity. He wants them to grow up into the deeper things of God. Let me ask this question. Who are we as a church? What are we supposed to be about? We looked at that last Wednesday night in verses 6 and 7. If you receive Christ, uh, receive Christ's free gift of salvation by faith, through faith, through repentance and trust in Christ's word, it makes you different. And Paul says you're to continue to live in him for the rest of your life. Walk ye in him. Every step you take, you take it in Christ. And that's what Paul was talking about in the text last week. He uses several words, rooted, which is a farming word, build up, a construction word, established, a language of school word. He uses all these words talking about the grace and knowledge of God, how we're to grow, how we're to mature in the faith. Well, let me dive into the text tonight, and I want us to gleam a few things from this text. First, Paul told the Colossians to be careful that they are not led astray. As I've noted before, this is a major theme in the book of Colossians. Keep in mind that the whole mandate of Christ for Christians is stated in two words. Follow me. He said that to Peter. He said that to Andrew. He said that to James John, the fisherman, Levi, the tax collector. Come, follow me. Yes, we unashamedly have theology, doctrine, core beliefs. We wholeheartedly embrace what has been called orthodoxy, but we never back away from the truth, the truth of God. And that is what Paul is admolishing the church at Colossia. God's words are perfect words. Anytime I'm following Christ, I'm okay. But if I don't follow Christ, I'm headed for trouble. That's what he says in the text, God's truth. Did God really say that? Read God's word and understand what God says. You see, the devil has been trying to get us to take our eyes off God's truth since the very beginning. Paul says, don't be led astray. And he uses several terminologies to get that point across. Philosophy. Men who have a human worldview. Uh, they don't speak with God's truth. They uh, give their own opinions. Does that make uh, really relevancy today? Absolutely. Uh, that's what today's time's all about. Uh, opinions. Sharing what I believe, what I think. It's not what I believe and what I think. It's what God says. And so empty deceit, you don't overpromise. It means you speak as an expert, but you don't know what you're talking about. You know anybody like that? Human tradition, the way something always has been done. Now, we're not to be anti-tradition, but we are in full support of what God wants, regardless if it's been done that way or not, it's God's way. And so Paul goes into all of this in his letter to Colossia. This is what life means. This is what marriage means. This is what sexuality means. This is what personhood means. 
This is the best way to take care of society. God's word speaks to all that. It gives us instruction. It's not what I think and what I want and my desires. It is what God wants. And folks, this was true with Israel at the giving of the Ten Commandments. Let me tell you something else. It's true tonight. It's true in the 21st century. The further we drift from the word of God, the more dangerous our lives become. Don't be led astray. That's the first thing that Paul says in the text that I read. But let me give you a second thing tonight. We must always remember the truth about Jesus Christ. The best way not to be led astray is to constantly turn your eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Every morning, every thought, every situation, every trial, every opportunity. Remember the Lord Jesus. Stand close to him. Rest in him. Why? All God's nature existed in the physical body of Jesus. Our deity and humanity. He was as much God as though not man, as much man as though not God. He's the God man. 100% God, 100% man. Jesus came. That's who he is. The powerful God of creation. He created this world in just six days. All the miracles we read about in the Gospels, food and demons and healings, God in Jesus did all of these miraculous things. God in, God in Jesus. God was in Jesus. And Jesus is in you. And Jesus in you overpowers the darkness. And that's what he's talking about. Christ achieved in us what the law could never do. Christ is our spiritual circumcision. Now, he talks about being circumcised. Uh, cutting away of flesh. Well, Paul uh, relates that to spiritual circumcision as Christ cuts away of, at our hearts. We become new creatures. We are different. We're peculiar. We're changed. It was the physical mark of tradition done by men now it is the spiritual mark of the truth done by Christ. Only Christ can do that, amen? Only Christ can do a work in my life. Only Christ can change who I am. Only Christ can take and break away the flesh of Mike Creekmore. Remember, Jesus' events, baptism at the Jordan Cross, burial and resurrection... And now our baptism is a picture of our being dead to sin. It's why we are baptized, by the way, by immersion. Dead, buried, raised to new life in Jesus. That's what baptism represents. I was previously dead. I could not perfectly obey the law in my own strength. There is a picture connection in the language, the guilt of being uncircumcised is compared with the guilt of breaking God's law. They are associated together, but Jesus, what's the Bible say? Forgave my trespasses. There was a nasty debt I couldn't pay. I was enslaved. I was bankrupt. But here's the good news. All of my guilt and sin was nailed to the cross. That's what the Bible says. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on my behalf. Nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. He bears it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Praise the Lord. All the demons of hell were disgraced through the triumph of Jesus. Sin is defeated. Satan 
may have temporarily won, but Jesus rose from the grave and he is the winner. Somebody said this, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns. Or calls me home here. In the power of Christ I stand. Woo. I'm going to get fired up. I love the language of Colossians. And how Paul speaks the truth here. Let me give you a third thing quickly. Not only do I see those first couple of things intertwined in the first few verses that I read. But also... If we continue this chapter, third, don't let your life be driven by the changing rules of men. Instead, be controlled by the permanent truth about Jesus. Don't be judged by food and drink. Don't be judged by festivals and moons. Don't be judged by the precise timing of the Sabbath. Yes, the Hebrew dietary laws were important. Yes, the principle of the Sabbath was important. But no, Jesus came to make all foods clean. Mark 7, 19. And the day of worship rest changed with the resurrection of Christ. The principles of holiness have not changed, but the application and spirit of God's truth were transformed by the coming of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 5, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Important word here. Are there elements of good things in well-intended people who sometimes major on the minors. Yes. But Paul is saying this. Don't be driven by all of these side details. Driven by things that don't matter. He's saying be driven by the truth of Jesus. Stay in the truth of Jesus. He talks about it, said it later on in the text. And angels and visions. And goes into really much of the tradition of the Old Testament. But let me go to a fourth thing tonight. Fourth, never forget if you're a Christian, you belong to Jesus, not the world. Let me say that again. You belong to Jesus, not the world. This is important. Biblical language here. Filled with good theology. Died with Christ to the world. The world crucified Jesus. The world will hate me. Did you hear me? Sometimes we think, man, I'd love to be liked by all people. Let me tell you, if you serve Jesus, the world will hate what you stand for. Jesus and Paul used very... Important vocabulary words here. Luke 9, 23 says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross daily and come after me. Galatians 2, 20, I love this text. For I am crucified with Christ, and the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. First, Corinthians 6.20, we have been bought with a price. We must glorify God with our body. In Paul's culture, the message was don't. But in our culture, the message is I do. The world always gets it wrong. I want you to hear this. The world always gets it wrong. The world, a reputation for wisdom and knowledge, but it's not. The world overpromises and underdelivers. Let me tell you, Jesus comes through. He's the author and finisher of our faith. 
Human regulations change and pass away. Self-made religion, false humanity, gets no one anywhere. Here's the bottom line. Paul told the Colossians to let nothing shape and influence their lives more than the truth of Christ. Nothing should shape us any more than the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, he loves us like no one else. He loves us like no one else. He's our creator. He's our redeemer. The purpose of Jesus is to love us and our purpose is to worship him. He shapes the clay. He's master over the servant. He's the shepherd over the sheep. He's the head over the body. He's the cornerstone over the building. He's the groom over the bride. He's the king over the adopted sons and daughters. The most important influence in a Christian's life is the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth about Jesus is supposed to transform everything about how we live. If we'll just spin our lives that way. Let me give you some applications tonight. Let me check my time. Got a few more minutes. Let me give you several points of application. Let us learn our Bible. That's application. Let us be informed by God's word. Read God's word daily. Ask God to teach you what it says. Spend, I don't know how long you spend in the Bible, but a good place. Start with 15 minutes with your face over an open Bible. It'll change your day. Study your Bible with godly friends. Be in a church where the Bible is preached, and the Bible is definitely preached right here. So one application is, Let us learn our Bibles. A second application is regularly ask this question. Does the activity I have the opportunity to be involved in shape me to be more like Jesus? Does it hinder me or does it help me pursue holiness? Number three, when it comes to serving others, am I doing it for myself for my church, or for Christ. If you offer a cup of cold water in his name, it's like you ministered to Christ. And you never know when that person that God places around you that you need to reach out to, that God is giving you an opportunity to serve him. Notice the negative language in this chapter. Paul says, don't be shaped by these things. Don't be shaped by what's wrong. All of us are being influenced and shaped by something, but may those things be the right things. May they be God things. May they be God's truth. And a fifth thing, yes, we honor our laws, we honor the government, and we honor cultural traditions. We don't seek to dishonor anyone or anything, but more than anything, we seek to honor Christ the most. Keep him first. Keep him central. When you're out and about, you represent him. You represent this church. You represent the ministry here. Where do you go to church? Well, I go to so-and-so church. The way you react tells that person what's going on here. Be in season and out of season. With the word of God. 
It's easy in season to trust God, but out of season, how are you doing trusting God? You see, on and on, the lessons go. The lessons are magnified in the book of Colossians. This Christian life is not just uh, getting through, not just journeying and getting to the other side. What we do in this life matters. Matters. We were just talking. Um, in several instances, we've seen God's protective hand in recent days. Well, we ought to praise him for that. Praise him for his goodness. God can turn adversity into triumph. And God is constantly doing that. God is working through circumstances and God is working through lives to mold and shape that we become more like him. And that's what Paul is talking about here. That's what Paul is is engrafting into our hearts in this text. Be mindful of what shapes you. Let the word of God shape you. Sometimes uh, somebody will say, I don't think we ought to do that. Well, why don't you think we ought to do that? Uh, Is that a word of God shaping you or is that your opinion? We need to be shaped by the words of God and not human opinion. You see, um, I I guess, well, I better not say that yet. (laughs) I'm going to say that a little bit later in our study. But uh, he's getting down to the brass tacks of what it means to be a Christian. And so as we get to about the halfway point in Colossians, Paul is getting down to the shoe leather of Christianity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in these few moments tonight, thank you for teaching us. Thank you for this study. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the power that's always present in the word of God. And Lord, help us to be mindful of the things that shape us. And may we be shaped by the word of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. Speak to us tonight as we go further into our time together in prayer. uh, I pray that you'll speak through the prayers of your people. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.